All righty, here we are on October 28th of 2020. It's the Dev Talk Show. I'm your host, uh, Chris Gomez, along with my co-hosts, Andy Schwamm and Rich Ross. I said that totally wrong. I didn't say it. I, I try not to say, like, I'm your host. That's how horrible. It's the three of us here to talk to you, and thank, thank you. you for being here uh, out in the audience. <laughs> you know, you just get to say it, and it comes out, and then you go, whoops. How how was that? So it's how's like everything Colbert? going tonight? Do you watch Do you watch Colbert on CBS? He calls it a late show, and you could be like, "I am a host." Uh, yes, a you're host. right. <laughs> Just one of the hosts. But you know what? We're glad that you're here, and and definitely be one of our co-hosts tonight. Join us in the chat and let us know what you think about our topic, which tonight is pattern matching in C sharp. Uh, the evolution of pattern matching. It's a, a relatively but not so new feature. Kind of new. And I just wonder if a lot of us are using it and maybe maybe should be. So looking forward to hearing what you think when, um, when we get going. So uh, let's see. We've got our friend Bruno is here in the chat and uh, hopefully well, safe and ready to vote. And, you just, you know, I'm sure let's see here we are in the end of October 2020. So that's an election year here in the USA, a presidential election year. There's elections a couple times a year in most places throughout the US. Um, but yeah, obviously those are big ones and there's certainly world news. And uh, I actually did drop in Pennsylvania. One of the things that we an option that I do have is to drop it into a Dropbox, which I did last week. Yeah. So I that is this week. Yeah. And I even got the confirmation back. Uh, I, I'm not sure how every county or the state is doing it, but at least where I am, I, I got an email confirmation that said, yep, yeah, we've got it. So that's cool. pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. So yeah. join the process, right? You got to be a yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah. So definitely big news here in the U.S. So thank you for asking about that, Bruno, and and thanks for being here. So, um, there one of the things that that we know comes to C sharp more recently. I would say C sharp six, seven, eight. I feel like the language is evolving quickly. If you compare to say the first fifteen years, um, certainly when when Link hit the hit the scene you know that was a big step c sharp added generics and then along came link and uh and 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 what else did we get with link we got type inference anonymous types and then i kind of feel like the language was was being serviced but then starting with c sharp 6 maybe i mean things are really moving in c sharp yeah, it is. It is true. If you think about how we used to do, well, we've talked about this on a show. How we used to do that C sharpen up uh, one day uh, event that I used to run. This is, gosh, many years ago. But but even at code camps or at other conferences, you know, you get the like, what's new and the latest version or something like that. And you know, you would get that. You know, every couple of years there'd be this new version. It seems like now there's just so much stuff coming out. It, it it's evolved. I mean. Um, Somewhat less on, I don't know what you would, uh, to me, I, I would compare like link or even generics. These are like fundamental, like major changes, um, you know, really changing the way you do things. Right. And then there are other changes that are that you, you developers miss. I've missed some of them, like I missed meaning it didn't even know that they came along and went like, it wasn't that like world news yeah. kind of announcement, yeah. but still, uh, if you're a professional, you know, you're a C-sharp developer, these are things that the team is delivering to make your job easier. Right. Oh, yep. And better, I think, you know, and so it's worth really paying attention to those little things that they're making improvements on sometimes, you know? Yeah, there's, uh, like you said, with generics, generics was huge because the language in the early days felt like it was really missing something before generics. You might recall that if you really needed a list of anything, we had like object list and object array, and it was not good. It was what yeah. you had. It, but was it wasn't. Had. It wasn't good. And uh, so I didn't that know was enough. I'll be honest. I didn't know enough to know I was missing something in those days. Like I knew what you're talking about, object array or whatever those. I forget even some of those what they're even called, but but I didn't have the. I don't know if I had the like, there should be more kind of 
in me, you know, like I was just like, well, this is what it has, you know, like right. I, I was a young developer in those days. How yeah. you do things. Yeah. Yeah. I was old, but I was a young developer. Yeah. Even though we even and so, know. yeah. And I mean like async await was pretty fundamental. I want to say that was C sharp five, but I'm oh, I could definitely be wrong. I, I could be wrong. That's a um, big, that was a big feature. That was a big change. Yeah. Fundamental change. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately it was like the fourth crack at an asynchronous programming model. So some of those other ones are still there, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, that's when you, when you create a language like C sharp, you can't break it. And so things live forever. Um, which is partially why we talked about things like records recently. You know, I, I think, I think there are some of some folks out there who wish records were in there or a way to create immutable reference types easily was in there kind of from the beginning. And, um, well, we have it now, right? So, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's interesting stuff. So, you know, pattern matching uh, definition of what that means. Um, it's not just a language feature. It, it does mean something that I think is a, a pretty good definition in the Microsoft Docs that um, I'm going to go ahead and steal unless you want to take a crack at it. Yeah, I was hoping when you said uh, definition, I was hoping this wasn't a quiz. It wasn't going to be. <laughs> it wasn't going to be a quiz. Which wants to. Uh... Swing. We can switch over if you're ready. I'll take pattern matching oh, for 200. Oh, yeah. I'm going to take a <laughs> so, shot out of here. So patterns, according to the, the docs, and we'll just read it right off of here. Uh, patterns test. In fact, since we're on the show here, why don't we make this a little bit bigger here? Woo! Oh, okay. oh, I thought you were going to grab your pen and start drawing on it. <laughs> it's coming. Um, patterns test that a value has a certain shape and can extract information from the value when it has the matching shape. So you know, I just want to say like, that doesn't sound exciting. No, I know. Right? But, you know I mean? It reads like, uh, okay, maybe I don't need to care about pattern matching. Like that, honestly, that's the way it reads. So let's you look know? at this part. You already create pattern matching algorithms using existing syntax. You write if or switch statements that test values. Then when those statements match, you extract and use information from that value. Now it's like, okay, I yeah. see. So what these to... new elements are promising is is making that easier, less verbose, maybe easier to read. That's the promise, and we're going to find out tonight if we if we like it. So cool. All right. Well, why don't we start off with one? Yeah, let's do it. Let's start off. And uh, you know we've been doing a lot of shapes, especially when we did Liskov substitution. Oh my, yeah. Here we go. So. <laughs> Uh, these, these were inspired by the C-sharp docs. And tonight, one of the things we're doing tonight, um, just to show everybody, is I'm keeping a browser open with some good resources. And then I really love this one tab. Um, I think one tab is pretty cool. There's other, there's other extensions that do the same thing where they basically bundle up all of the tabs that are in your browser at that point. And if I wanted to, I can uh, turn it into a URL and then we can share that with everyone and everyone will have all the resources we did tonight. Awesome. But you can't do it ahead of time because that 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 tab is immutable. And I'd love to add things if we either hear them from the chat or from either of you tonight. So I don't want to uh, I didn't want to say, like, here's the one tab for tonight and then say, like, oh, but wait, there's a few more. So. This is um, a pattern matching demo. And this is going to be before C Sharp 6, because I, the earliest that I could find when pattern matching concepts came into the language, uh, as, as I think they fit in today's term, was C Sharp 5. So that, that begs a question. How do you get your Visual Studio uh, environment? Or um, if you're not in Visual Studio, if you're just in Visual Studio code or any, uh, you're not even using an IDE. You're just building text files and you're running them through .NET uh, build, right? Mm -hmm. How do you pick a, how do you constrain yourself to a language? Well, it turns out that the project file, the CS proj has a lang version attribute. It's not going to be there by default. Um, but if you add it, you can constrain the language, which is really cool. I, I think it's neat, especially if you're someone like this, if you say, Hey, how were things before? I actually don't feel like this was all that easy until recently, until the new CS proj format. So, um, yeah, I think you could go to like project properties or something yep. like that. Couldn't you, you know? Yeah. Right. But the thing about this though, and, and I know there's some yeah, stuff right. here is this is just changing the CS proj file. 
right? Oh yeah, yeah, right, so, exactly. Yeah. Um, I just think it's it's super nice and easy now. So if you want to know how to do that, then and this is going to be in the set of one tabs. <clears throat> by when you cr when you create a new project with a target framework, there's a language version default .NET five for C sharp nine. .NET Core 3.x for C Sharp 8 and so on. And you can override that by choosing these monikers here, 8.0, 7.3, 7.2, 7.1, and so on. So, um, you know, you'll have that resource in the, the one tab because I needed it. I needed to look that up. So mm -hmm. here's a C Sharp 6, uh, C Sharp 5 set of classes. Um, one thing that's interesting to note here is if I take out the set here. We did have auto implemented properties. That was a feature that might've come out in five or four. I don't know for sure, but you might, I don't know if you guys remember when you actually had to write the getter and setter, even if all it did was return the value or set the value based on what came and did no computation whatsoever. Yep. So when we got auto implemented properties, that was cool. But when I, when I went to go uh, copy some of this code from the docs to use as a starting point for the sample, I said, what? And it's like, oh, read only automatically implemented properties is not available in five. You've got to use six or greater. And I said, well, that's our first That's our first step is in C Sharp 5. We didn't even have that. Um, so these are just some classes. All they do, all they do is you can uh, create each type, a square only. And what you're trying to, what we're, the, the point of this is to have enough information about each of these shapes to compute the area. Um, certainly... Um, maybe not the greatest example because somebody here could point out why aren't they, why aren't you using an inheritance hierarchy, stuff like that. There's also a struct thrown in here. The rectangle is a struct for no other reason to see how that all mixes and matches. So anyways, were there any questions before we get started here on, on these simple classes? Well, you know, there is a, I was going to respond in chat. There was a question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Willie Mammoth is saying, is this show scope to .NET development? And I, I guess it depends on what you mean by this show. Uh, in general, the uh, the dev talk show, um, you know, we lean a lot on, on Microsoft technologies here, but not necessarily scoped to .NET development. We'll talk about other things, but a lot of it does tend to be in the Microsoft world. Tonight's show is specifically about C Sharp, the language C Sharp, uh, and we're not afraid to talk about, um, you know, other languages and other things like that. But um, I guess this one is pattern matching is, is like a C sharp feature. Right. And other languages may have pattern right. matching, which might be interesting to talk about in, in the in the in the scope yeah. of that, that show. Uh, other shows, Willie Mammoth, other episodes we have are less uh, are sometimes less um, dot netty. But uh, we, we, we pretty much, you know, we, we, we often stay in the .NET space. And so yeah. William Mammoth's responding, cool, don't do any anything in the MS world, but was curious about pattern matching in C Sharp. Yeah, yeah, if you're familiar with uh, pattern matching in other langs, that's cool. Um, uh, you know, maybe you'll see something. Feel free to yeah. uh, share a comment with us if, if you think uh, another language does it better or worse yep. or something like that. Throw it in. You know, we're always yep. interested in... in talking with the viewers and stuff. So Willie Mallet, yeah, welcome absolutely. to the show tonight. Yeah, this uh, is a community conversation for sure. And and I would I would say that we're not gonna get to it tonight, but uh, doing this show got me really interested in the language in language comparison type shows because many of these features were definitely inspired by F sharp. And as I've explored some other functional languages, now I find myself comparing and contrasting how they might do similar things, F sharp to Elixir to functional aspects of JavaScript or, 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 or Scala or something like that. And even if you don't know those languages, it's still interesting to look, oh, look at how they're doing that over there. And it really gets you thinking, boy, I wonder if I should take a look over there. <laughs> so our program is really simple. We have, um, uh, which one of these? I've got the wrong, sorry, the wrong one open. So our program is really simple. All we're gonna do is we have a method called compute area. And, and these are just, this is just a static function in the program class. We're not doing any object or any programming, anything like that tonight. And for each one of these object types, we're going to create a square and a square, a square takes a double, which just represents a side. So now we know that's four by four by four by four. I mean, four on each side. It was not a four dimensional square. Not a cube. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
and then we've got a circle with a radius of four. We've got a triangle. The the base is six, and the the height is ten. Um, we've got a rectangle, and uh, the rectangle takes a length and a height. And all it's going to do is just output the values after calling compute area. That's the pattern matching part. Okay. Let's take a look at some other interesting things though in C sharp five. Uh, look at the way I'm doing string formatting in C sharp five. Are you are you two still doing this, or are you off to string interpolation, which we'll get to see in C sharp six, thankfully. Yeah, definitely off um, to the interpolation. Yeah. What's what's that, Rich? Sorry. Definitely off to the interpolation way of doing yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So you're sort of stuck with this because you're running an old version yep. of .NET to show the changes, right? But yep. yeah, yep. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I remember I thought this used to be great, uh, but string interpolation <laughs> was yeah. Not kicks, and, I mean, that's just beautiful. And just thing. A, a quick aside for those who don't know, right? Interpolation is instead of having the the curly braces with the number in there, reference to the order of the property that you're trying to bring into that space you basically just put the property in there oh, i'm sorry you have it right above there, there i have it go. as a comment but you're right <laughs> good man this is the this would be the modern way in most cases that you would create your string with a little and we're going to see it we're going to see it and then you get to put the expression right in here and it just reads so much more naturally so we don't have the new pattern matching features we don't even have c sharp six features so what did we have to do we use if we did have is We've had the is keyword, but the is keyword only, it only told you true or false, uh, was this type, what you, add, you know, is, is shape a square. That was all it could do. It couldn't do anything else. We're going to see that, that the is keyword has been enhanced. Um, so so this is what we had to do. Yeah. And that was basically the equivalent of, you know, sh uh, lowercase shape type of, you know, mm -hmm. Does it equal square, right? That, that's kind of what that maps right. to. Okay. That's basically what that is. Yeah. So we're coming in here. We're calling compute area on each of these different class types and rectangle happens to be a struct. Um, and, and this code, this is before pattern matching constructs started appearing in C sharp six. It works. You can say if the shape <laughs> is a square, then let's, uh, and I'm using type inference here, then let's, then let me cast it to a shape. Um, I'm sorry, cast it to a square. And then since I know that's what I want to do with a square is multiply the side by itself, then then there's my answer. And I'm just implementing the rest of it, pi r squared and half the base times the height and height and length. And um, and this is how we had to do things. We did at this time, we did have the ability to do uh, these parameter. I'm not sure if these were in from the beginning. They might have been. This might have been added where you could parameterize your function call instead of making sure you got the first one first, the second one second. But we, there's a feature that we don't have yet that I couldn't use here. So does this work? Well, yeah, sure, it works fine. Um, you know, and 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 I would say that your C sharp developer was used to doing things this way. And I would even venture to say that was anyone really asking to do it any differently? It worked. This is how yeah, it we, worked. Right. This is what I mean, I think in, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, someone would say, well, maybe a switch statement. Uh, which doesn't necessarily apply here, I, I don't think, because of the is. But um, you know, there if else, like there are other ways to do that kind of um, you know logic of repeating the yeah. else if else if else if. But yeah, that, that's sort of what we had to work with. At this point in time, the switch, the bound for the switch had to be a constant, and right. that was, that was limiting. So the switch yep. statement also had to be modified to make pattern matching work. So let's move on. What did we get? in C sharp six. Well, first of all, we got auto implemented read only properties. So I got rid of all the sets. I didn't change anything else in here. There is a little, little bit of trivia here that we missed the first time I used this. I used this in, in five. This is from the beginning of C sharp. And so a little bit of a uh, trivia here. Do you know why I, I, what the, uh, at sign does when used in well, an identifier? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure in this case why, but that usually is because base is a keyword. That's exactly it. You got it. Yeah, right. Yep. We use that a lot for like, uh, I actually work, you know, in, in, in insurance uh, and the word class, we do have classes of insurance and stuff like that. So it's not uncommon for us to see like at class because okay. it's, it's not it's not a C sharp class. Nope. But it's an insurance class, right. and so we like and, to use that word. Uh, and you <laughs> insisted on, you said, I want to keep using the word. You want to keep using the business domain language. Yeah, yeah. Where in many other languages, or even just sometimes 
other projects, the developers might say, well, let's call it something else. We'll yeah. call it an insurance class. But you chose, sure. you said, let's not do that. And C Sharp, that's not a new feature. That's a beginning right. of time. Always been there. So yeah. little aside. So I'm now let's look at- Walk down memory lane on some of these things here. Yeah, let's look at the program now in C Sharp 6, where we got our string interpolation. Doesn't have anything to do with pattern matching. But we got our first hint of what padding matcher might be because C Sharp 6 is not the introduction of pattern matching. I was w wondering if anybody would jump in and say, God, why are you talking about C Sharp 6? It didn't come out until 7. In C Sharp 6, we got a feature called exception filters, which is the hint that pattern matching was to come. Oh. So in C Sharp 6, we got catch an exception when it meets a certain expression. And I tried to think of a much better example than this. I actually was disappointed that I felt like, gosh, this doesn't really show the power of exception filters. And it almost makes you say, like, well, why would you ever use this? Um, but the idea Once was is, is if the <laughs> argument exception has a certain shape, you know, uh, and I don't mean the word shape here. It has a certain shape and value. It's, it's pram name equals shape. Then, then this clause should take effect. And if it doesn't, then I can add a general catch-all argument exception clause right after it, and it'll catch all the rest of them, all the rest of the exceptions, if that's what I wanted. So um, that's something we could do in C-sharp 6, and it was the harbinger of what was coming, that, that pattern matching was coming. Um, certainly in other languages, I think you would definitely call this a guard clause. I think like an Elixir programmer would think of it like like that. Um, just that's to, what uh, Wooly Mammoth talk, suggested right. and I'm, you saw. To be it. totally fair, Wooly, I, I read Wooly Mammoth's chat. Uh, I was just bringing it up on the on the feature chat, and, and you were saying it at the same time, so that was kind of funny, but yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Everything's clicking. Uh, and just when things are clicking, that's oh, no. when things stop. <laughs> and that's when things stop. So, uh, so to those of you who are watching, it looks like Chris is frozen temporarily. And that seems to happen <laughs> sometimes once a show for about a minute or so. It's not usually too long. While we're and, while we're in and this Chris pod, can usually hear us too. But go ahead. And he can usually hear us, and we can make fun of him, and then he won't be able to do anything about it. But uh, at the same point, we can stop and remind people that we are here Wednesday uh, nights at uh, eight thirty Eastern U.S. time, which will be changing uh next week you know depending on where you live because of uh, daylight savings and stuff like that uh coming into play next week um but you know you can find us here on wednesday nights and uh you can also find us on youtube at uh youtube.com slash the dev talk show and in either of those places we would love it if you follow us or subscribe or whatever the whatever the thing is that you do on that particular uh you know type of channel and uh, and be a part of the show and, and we love for people to make comments and if you're here and you're not making comments and you're just hanging in the back that's cool too we love to have you here uh everybody's welcome and i see chris moving and so it looks like chris is magically back with us and i just did my little tap dancing stall for a minute and uh it's like he was never gone right chris yep all right all right so t sharp seven this is where it gets fun right mm-hmm Let's take a look at that when we get back to the screen here. So no changes at all in C-sharp 7 to the different class types. But now we get to see some pattern matching. And the first thing we get to see is in our compute area method, we now have the ability to just, and it just seems so subtle, right? We just get to add an identifier here. And that identifier, what I'm going to do is bring up the C-sharp 6 version. Without the identifier, I have to take the extra step of casting the value to a new identifier, to a square S. This doesn't have to say var, by the way. This could say square. Mm -hmm. So um, if shape is square, then give me an S. That's the cast of shape to square, and then do what I need to do. But in C sharp 7, we now, we got this. The is keyword was modified, so that if you put an identifier after it, then the language says, the compiler says, oh, well, if this turns out to be true, then I'm going to go ahead and give you an S, and it will be it will be a shape, and then you you the code starting to look a little bit cleaner here. Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, Chris, I don't know if you found this in your research. When did I don't know if it exactly relates to this, but when did the as K 
keyword come in. So remember, you, you could also do now, at least, I don't know when, you could say something like var s equals uh, shape as square, right? Yeah, That was early on, yeah. wasn't it? I think the as keyword might have been around from the beginning because you're right. We could have rewritten some of that. Yeah. Um, right. We could have rewritten some of the other code. Like we could rewrite this. You, you make a good point here. We could say if uh, couldn't you rewrite it this way? I think typically what you do is you take uh, away that the may if not at be the right. top. Is it? Chris, you take away the if at the top and you okay. say uh, square s equals square. Yeah, oh, equals I shape see. as square. Right. And then you check for null. But then you got to check for null. Right. So either way, you're still writing that. Um, there's some yeah. there's some benefits. Sometimes it works better. But um, oh, you're not uh, wrong. You're not wrong. So like, let's just let's just go ahead and show it. Let's just go ahead and show it. Square two equals uh, shape shape as, as square. square. And then the problem, if you want to call it a problem, is is we don't know if square two is null because right. if it's not a square, then that would be null. And right. you'd be sad. So then the next thing that would happen is, is you'd probably check if it was null. So fair is enough. Is it any better than what you have? I, I don't know, right? <laughs> Maybe it's worse. You know, I imagine knows? there are definitely arguments, yeah. <laughs> both yeah. in style and also maybe what really gets generated. Because some people right. will go dig into like what gets generated and say, hey. So we got this in C Sharp 7 uh, to begin with. And this is, this is you know, I would say that uh, this probably isn't going to excite anybody because yes, it certainly works. Um, but it, you know, what did it do? It eliminated one line of code. Um, it certainly prevents you from having to do the null check. Um, there's something about the scope of these variables too. I think if I understood the spec correctly, in order to stay backward compatible, I believe that like C is only scoped here and t is only scoped here and r is only scoped here but but only if and only if these clauses get activated like if you actually jump into here but there's something about i was reading about the if clause and i really got confused as to how they said well in order to stay backward compatible you know the scope of s doesn't go out of scope until they said really okay well i'll worry about that another time. <laughs> so so let's look That's at where pattern watch. Yeah, let's look at where pattern matching got a little bit more excited. And it was the switch. It was definitely the switch. Because now what we could do with switch statements that we couldn't do before is is this doesn't have to be a constant anymore. Right. Um, and that applies to – it was a big deal. Well, mm -hmm. When I say this, I mean that these things don't have to be constants. And it's a big deal because now I can test for shape. And if shape is a square, then not only do I want to fall into this block of code, uh, give me that that s that represents the square, and so I can just go okay. to work. Yeah, that's cool. That's looking pretty nice, right? Yeah. Now, I'm going to move on to some other ways that pattern matching enables other C sharp features to take advantage of. I think we could do another whole show on what what the C sharp language calls expression bodied members. Um, JavaScript developers would just look at them as like arrow functions. They're like, oh, you mean arrow functions, but since C sharp has lots of other concepts that JavaScript doesn't have, like, uh, which isn't, that's not a negative on JavaScript. JavaScript treats, you know, everything's a function, everything's an object, everything's an object, first of all. So in C sharp, we have fields, we have properties, we have, like, we have all these different concepts. And so they had to be mapped over time. Anyways, the next version, the next version is let's do more. Let's do more than just say, is it a square? Remember that when from exception filters? We can use those now. We can say, I don't just want to know if it's a square. I want to know if it's a square whose side uh, field property is uh, equal to zero. And what, what I can do with that now is I could, I'm not going to try and tell you this is the most useful code in the world. Um, because your argument might be, why didn't you just let it fall through here and it would all just work anyway? Yes, I know. But if this is zero or if radius is zero or if base or base or height are zero, so now we're seeing this expression is, is pretty, you know, it doesn't just have to be testing one value. It's an expression. I can put any valid expression here. 
And if any of these four cases turn out to be true, then let's return zero. Let's forget doing the that expensive calculation. So, um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I can keep using my old block where if it's a square, then do the calculation, do the calculation, do the calculation. But look at another thing that we can do in switch statements now. Null has been able has been enabled as um, a test in switch statements. So this is considered true. It is considered to be equal to null if shape tests for null. Under the covers, it does a shape is null. And I can uh, I can I can handle that case right here, which I couldn't do before. So that's kind of neat. Um, the other thing is, is that throw is now, um, I don't know if this happened in C sharp seven, but throw becomes, they call it, they're called throw expressions. And this is one of those cases where you as a C sharp developer would see it and say like, but I thought you could always do that. But no, it turns out you couldn't because throw had to be enabled as an expression. C sharp has a concept of statements and expressions, right? And so um, sometimes that's all invisible to us as developers. Like we just write code and we don't, do, I don't ever stop to think about it and say like, wait, am I writing an expression or am I writing a statement? You know, you're just writing the next line of code. Mm. So yeah, we got we think about it, right? <laughs> so we got this when keyword, which looked like it came right out of exception filters, but it's uh, allowing us to say, don't just test what it is, test some features, test something about it. So that's kind of neat. And then yeah, it's a big deal. It, you know, it's really helpful. Yep. And then um, this is a little bit of an aside. I created one more function called is circular. And it was again to show how I can stack. If an object is a square, rectangular, or a triangle, I want to say it's not circular. So I'll just put all those cases stacked and say return false. And I can say, if it's a circle, return true. If it's null, then throw the exception. If it's default, if nothing happens, and if 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 I can't, if I don't know that it's null, but it didn't match any of these, then let's throw this other exception that says that it's not a recognized shape. But you can see what I'm using here. This is not part specifically of pattern matching, but it right. becomes very useful with pattern matching, and that is called the discard. Yeah, I was going to actually ask why you're using the discard in this example, because you're not, it's, it's, you're not really, I don't know. I didn't know the discard applied in this case, in this use case. So not the main reason, case, the, word case. the main reason I made this up to show the discard is I don't use the square. You're right that you could just take them out. You could just take them out. Right? Oh, okay. I've never put them in, in, in this syntax. Like, yeah. So yeah, there's no need for it really. Right. Right. There. But okay. now that we have, um, discards, might show up in some later examples. And so uh, that way, at least we know what it is. Those have been in F sharp forever. Um, there's also there's also a, a discard type value in Elixir where you basically say, listen, I don't really care what this is. Um, although I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm all an Elixir expert. It's a language that I'm currently learning. I really do. I really am enjoying it, though. So nothing changes down here. Nothing at all other than uh, so we haven't really done a whole lot. In, in C sharp seven. Um, let's see. Did we get anything different here? Yeah. Yeah, we did uh, a couple things anyways. So I think, I think in, if we go up to today, I think we've seen, we saw the switch light and we saw switch. Oh no, actually no, nothing different did get added here. Okay. All right. So, Let's 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 take a moment here and stop and say, OK, one thing pattern matching enables is what you're seeing right here, which is a, a somewhat more powerful switch statement. Um, were switches part of your vocabulary before um, before you before you like with switches? Would you reach for the switch statement or would you stick with if else more often? Um, Rich or me? Yeah, yeah, either of you. I know Rich. I'm putting you on the stop on the. Stop. I um, I oh, I liked switch. Uh, switch. I used it very often. Uh, for if when it was you know with, under the circumstances that would match, like 
uh, well, when it had to be a string, like a constant, you know, of course, it, I'd have to, as long as it worked, I would work. Where I didn't use a switch is where you had complex things prior to pattern matching. You just couldn't use a switch. It just wasn't as good as, now the if else has got kind of ugly as well. Uh, and then you start trying nested ifs, you know, like, right, there was a lot of, it, it was ugly, uh, but but that was what we had to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I like switch statements personally. Yeah, same. I, and I think in the same way that Andy described it, right, as long as you could use the switch, it was a little, it was easier syntactically to read coming along as opposed to a bunch of nested if else statements. Yeah, and I just put up a, a chat message. Um, it might be there for, a, had been there for a bit, but um, Wooly Mammoth was wondering if F Sharp already had this. Now the problem is, uh, not exactly yeah. sure which this he's, uh, Wooly Mammoth is talking about. Um, I think pattern so, matching. So we'll see if yeah. this answers the question. So here's an example of F Sharp pattern matching. If you had a type, a discriminated union um, in F Sharp, that this color could either be red, green, or blue. Then uh, here's a function print color name that takes a color. And what it does is it matches the color. And then you use this syntax to basically say, these are my options. And if it's red, then if it's red, then print red. And if it's green, then print green. And if it's blue, then print blue. And if it's, if it's anything else, this is not quite the same thing as a discard. This is if it's anything else, then do nothing. So, uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, this is like how it looks in F-sharp. It's like a long form discard, discard, right? Yeah, you can <laughs> use this. It is, it is technically a discard because right. um, if you were to write a more complex expression and basically say, you know, if you get to this, I still want to do work. I don't just want to do nothing. You are informing the compiler, but I don't care what this is. So don't even right. bother. Right. You know, don't, don't do any work there. Default. I'll make sure I include that pattern matching for F sharp in there. Um, okay. So do you think, is there code you have today that this jumps out at you and you say, boy, I should be doing this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I can say that easily enough. Yes. Uh, okay. Is it because the case statement or, or the oh, number one, it could be an if statement that was too, got complex because you couldn't use switch. Or the switch statement only kind of, do you ever get that feeling where the switch statement, yeah, I matched on this one dimension of the problem, but now the case block has got to be if and else and if. And then yeah. you just scrap the whole yeah. thing and start writing right. individual functions, like a almost like detector functions, right? You'll say, because I, I don't want to have this, um, I don't want to have this switch statement that also has complex ifs and else's in the case block. So then you scrap the whole thing and you, you'll write a function like, is a diesel vehicle yes. and that thing dives into the object and figures out if it's a diesel vehicle. Sure. It checks like six of the properties yeah, uh, and compares it to like, is it a leap year? Like whatever the, whatever <laughs> the complex Boolean logic is that you didn't want to build into this, uh, into this expression, you know, you, you did it like you were trying to make things clean and then do things that way. And that was just what we were, um and uh yeah Willie mammoth is saying staircasing if else that's a good i don't think i've ever heard that word staircasing yeah, staircasing, staircasing if else or if the pyramid of doom there. is what i called it even though that's technically the javascript folks use that term for the endless uh endless um uh, asynchronous callbacks but <laughs> i love that staircasing i love that js that's, callback that's hell yep. phrase, yeah i uh, like it yeah you're right you definitely get into that uh it's it's uh it's terrible for testing. It's terrible for readability, um, you know, and then, you know, someone doesn't indent something. I mean, it depends on the language you're using, but, you know, um, you know, if someone doesn't indent anything, it's hard to read. Although nowadays I don't see those issues too often. Like, remember, we used to have that whole big deal. Oh, my gosh, someone didn't indent something. And I can't it's really hard to follow. But I, I think that uh, modern uh you know, environments to handle the formatting pretty well. And that's not such yeah. a big issue, but still, you know, that was, that used to be a thing, right? Oh my gosh. So know. if you get some messy code in your individual studio, do you have a key sequence that you hit to, to fix it up? Yeah. Control do KD you? or control okay, K and control if, D. 
Yeah. I was wondering if either of you did that because I do. It, it works most that. of the time. There are times when it doesn't, but uh, right. And I think that also works in code as well. I've had that. I think same. it's Alt Shift F to format in code. The problem is they're different in code. It makes me crazy because I get used to one and then I get yeah. really confused when I go to the other uh, and then I forget the old one. I, I yeah. So in, in Visual Studio Code, that would be controlled by the extension, which in this case would be the C Sharp extension. And in Visual Studio, not only do I think you're right that it's different, I also think it's configurable. I well, think you can write configuration to say, do I put my new curly brace on a second line or do I not? And mm. I, I think it's configurable, um, which doesn't help, right? I mean, it sort of helps, but... Yeah, well, you could also configure the uh, that editor the, the, config thing. The key, uh, the key. Uh, what do you call them? Uh, shortcut key. You know. Oh sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you could change it to be yeah. uh, whatever it is in code and make yep. sure that Visual Studio is the same and all that kind of pain in the neck. But it's just, I, I wish that uh, that some of the keystrokes were the same in code as they are in Visual Studio for those of us, you know, moving in that direction. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So but anyway, yeah, let's take a look at uh, a more complex example that hopefully will bring a lot of this together. I think, um, let's see if I can do this. Okay. Uh, let me try and keep this a little simpler. So let's say we have, let's say we have this, um, this car class and a car has a number of passengers. Um, and then we also have a delivery truck that has a gross weight. We have a taxi that has fares and a bus has a capacity and riders. And you are responsible for figuring out the toll for each of these vehicles based on, um, a toll system that's, that's really complex and even kind of mean. So to start things off a car, is two dollars a taxi is three fifty a bus is five dollars and a delivery truck is ten so we've kind of already done some of this um, I would say because we uh, let's see what do we need to do this I I actually want to create another uh, let me see if I can do it with this one Sorry well don't we that. need to move all those uh, values into a database then build an entity <laughs> framework. Uh, and then do the repository pattern on top of that. So we can bring in the values, query them. Uh, then we could, uh, you know, use dependency injection to bring all that together and, um, you know, and then write unit tests on it before you show it here today. <clears throat> yeah. So instead, <laughs> let's create, let's create a toll calculator and let's see um, if we can get this, get this working. So, uh, what do we need? Well, since, since, um, you might've noticed that those different, uh, these different things are in their own namespaces. So my little toll calculator needs to, to bring those in. And then, um, what else do we need? Let's go ahead and call this public. And then, um, let's, let's say that, that based on the, the first, set of values that I gave you, we're going to return a money value. So decimal is a pretty good type for that, right? And let's use calculate toll. And let's say that if the object is a vehicle, so let's do this, let's do the dot net way where people <coughs> camel case that there. And we're going to say switch. So does anybody, let's, let's, let's write the code now. We all saw it. So here's the quiz. Hmm. I'm going to switch on what? Does do you remember? Um, well, you're going to switch on the vehicle. Oh, the, diff- the different vehicle oh. class is going to determine the dollar amount. So I say switch vehicle. Right. And then we're going to say, uh, what was it? Case, Case. car. Yeah. C, right? Yeah, so vehicle's not a base class, though, right? Like, cause it does seem odd that you're passing an object into this thing, right? But no, it's these are not derived off of a base class. Right. They're all in their own namespaces. The theory okay. behind this sample is they might be from different systems. Yeah, that's interesting. Like you're showing the 
the, a fair amount of like the extremeness of what you can do with this, you know? Yeah. And so what I can do is I can say, you know, let's return a decimal of two, right? Pretty easy. And now I, I, and I know you probably don't remember, you probably don't remember cars were $2 taxis are three fifty. And then there's a couple others to do too, but I'm going to, I'm going to pause here for a second. Okay. Okay. We saw this syntax before. And, um, and in fact, as it, as it does point out here, you don't even really need the C, but we'll come back to that. So, um, what you're all going to see a little bit later is that this is based on a sample that's in the docs. So what's really cool about this, it's on GitHub, it's in the docs. You'll be able to follow this along. It's, it's really, really awesome. But there's another way to do switch statements. And this sort of creeps into the uh, expression bodied member show that I'm, that I'm kind of considering is what if some people like this, right? What if we used an expression bodied member here? This is a function in C sharp now. And this is how you do a switch expression. And the reason why we're bringing this up is because switch expressions support pattern matching. So I'm saying here that take a vehicle and then switch on it. And if it's a car, then charge, then, then return $2. This code's equivalent. This is equivalent code. Maybe I should have left the other code up. Mm, so, yeah. Um, in fact, we can probably, what we can do is, uh, is we can, oh, actually, sorry. That, that's like a complete, that's a complete, off. that's a complete function. That function is done. So that's calculate toll. And this is calculate toll with a switch. And I'm going to say this is calculate toll with a switch expression calculating a toll just your i don't want to call it a normal switch but certainly it's the traditional switch yeah. right and in the traditional switch we said switch vehicle and we used curly braces and we said that if a car if it's a car um see i i, I wanted to slip into it right case right <laughs> yeah case car you're right you're right rich and you use the return uh explicitly is that what i would say um and then we you we say that if it's a taxi then it's 350 for a toll i, I don't know what jurisdiction this is but but let's uh let's close that a little didn't bit so we can at see one all point, the code. didn't we at one point have to put the break even if it was a return or am i misremembering that i think you're i re yeah i remember doing that yeah and it just became habit whether we still needed it or not well, yeah, right, but you, yeah, but you don't need it right anymore. So that's that's kind of a nice nicety. I don't know where that came into the language. At, at some yeah, point. there's some problems too with both of these methods. One of them is that this doesn't return. You know, if if you're right that if it turns out to be none of the above, then then what do you do? And we had that case before. We had default. Yeah, default. Yeah. And uh, in default, then we'll say what we'll do for default is we'll do this. Ten bucks. Like, not know what you are. It's expensive. <laughs> oh, look at you. All right. I was going to throw an exception. But the interesting thing here is, is that we're not handling it in this other. So, so the thing I want to start off with is, is I think, I think it's pretty fair to say this is equivalent code. This is the traditional switch. It is using the newer pattern matching. This is a switch expression. And we're going to, we're going to see more pattern matching features drop in here. So how do you do the default case? just like this. And this is why we needed a feature to the language called throw expressions, because otherwise that was not allowed mm -hmm. to be able to throw out of an expression. This code might look really unfamiliar to seasoned C sharp developers. I so, think. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely um, different. We have a question in the chat. I'm trying to bring it up here. Uh, our friend Richard Waisaki is asking uh, what version of .NET is this getting introduced? I think he might've came in a little late. We, we did talk about that at certain points, but Chris, yep. you are currently using? Uh, in this particular example, it's C-sharp nine, but I don't think it requires C-sharp nine to do just what you're seeing on the screen here. What is a little confusing about pattern matching 
is that it's been coming into the language since C sharp seven. So what I'm going to try is I'm going to try seven and let's see when I come back here. Yeah, I, these switch expressions aren't going to be in seven and the type pattern is not in seven. Oh, interesting that it says that it wants nine for the type pattern. Although um, I wonder if I would have done this. Yep. So if I would have assigned a variable, oh, look at then that. it works in C sharp seven. <sighs> so this is what makes this a little peculiar um, is that these these pattern matching features are being layered into the language. Some came in in seven, some came in in seven, one, seven, two, I think eight and now nine. And it can get really frustrating because like you try to step stair through them and you say, wow, we'll be here for hours. So we are jumping kind of to the end of what you can do. But I do appreciate that I can quickly test by going to lang version. If I set it to eight, cool. I don't think that's going to fix the switch expression. Oh, actually. So here's what happened. Yes. This, yeah. yeah. You know what? C sharp eight gave me this switch expression. But what is it complaining about? Oh, but you but you but you don't have the type pattern where you can just use the bare type. So you have to assign a variable. Um, this doesn't cover the null pattern. So they're saying, wait a second, you might put a null in here. So let me cover the null pattern. And let me ask you a question. You see how the compiler is helping me write a switch statement that will be more resilient? Is it helping me in the traditional version? And I think the answer is no. I, I mean, if a null comes in here, does it blow up or does it go to default? I, I don't know. Right. I do know that this, and I feel like I should remind uh, our, our viewers, including uh, Richard Waisaki, who's asked some questions and maybe wasn't here at the beginning, that there will be a quiz <laughs> at the end of the show um, <laughs> to remember which version yeah. all of these different features came in. Because this is really confusing. But the good news is, while it's all interesting to us, like when did this come along and what, and that's a lot of us have uh, projects at work that are on different versions of, of, of .NET or C Sharp, right? You have a couple of applications that are older, some newer stuff, and um, we don't always work in the, in the most current version, but if you are working in the most current version, then it's easy, you just you use it all. Yeah. You know? So we talked a little bit earlier about discards and why do you need them? Well, if you're in C Sharp 8, you can't do this test without them. It, didn't let, it doesn't let me, right? I can't just say, tell me if it's a car. It goes, no. No, I'm sorry. I don't have the type pattern in C Sharp 8. So I could assign a variable and then it's going to yeah, complain further it. and it's going to say, but you unnecessary assignment. <laughs> it's like, so come wait, on. Does it tell you? Does it tell you? To, yeah, it says use discard. So it's smart. Why not use to, a discard, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, is the discard, though, is uh, is is that sort of like syntactic sugar? Like it's it's. It's making it obvious to future developers that this is meant to be discarded, and the C implies shouldn't you be using this C because you went and assigned it to something, or is it really like a a construct uh, at a compiler level where that discard really throws it away or something like that? What actually happens? I'm not going to pretend that I know for sure, but we can look at the docs that say starting with C sharp seven, C sharp discards discards temporary dummy variables intentionally unused. It does say here because there is only a single discard variable and that variable may not even be allocated storage. So you know what that tells me? Yeah. It tells me that maybe the compiler allocates something, but don't bank on it if we change the compiler someday. I feel like that's what it's saying. Yeah, because they're not saying it doesn't allocate. They're saying right. it may not. And you're, you're, inter you're on to something there. It sounds like right now it's, it's probably getting assigned to something, but they have this idea that they're going to get rid of it and they're right maybe i'm 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 actually i'm not sure that i would uh like i don't know that i would bet on it that that's <laughs> correctly how it works that that's how it works but I, i'll give you that certainly what they're they're telling you is is it's no we have, there's no contract that we're going to allocate anything for you so um you know don't rely on it right right they could they could basically optimize this code in compiler land to mm -hmm. never allocate a car and just check to see that it's a car, and you've got to be ready for that. Right. So to finish off that whole example and basically say, okay, we've got buses, we've got delivery trucks, 
Um, this is switch expressions and switch expressions use pattern matching. So that's why, you know, you, you, I wanted to, to get these in here. And now, wait, just one second, because you yep. could you you sort of started off by uh, saying that like on line 10, you're using that um, expression method syntax, right? Versus line 21, it's a like a traditional method, right? Mm -hmm. But the switch statement being an expression could be used in either one of those. Yeah. I mean, this is yeah. a switch statement. This is a switch expression. Right. But you also, uh, one of them, you're you're using the the lambda syntax uh for the ex for the method itself uh this uh okay so i I'm get what you're saying, saying. Like, you're saying yeah. you're saying what if we did this right um i yeah what if we did this what if we had yet another method and i'll try to keep this quick some method that takes an object vehicle and and you're saying traditional method declaration, mm -hmm. right? But we throw this in here. Yeah, you just put a return, right? And it'll right. I think yes. Yeah. So you know what? Good good note. Good note. Um, yeah. Because I mean, you're right. They're not. It's not exclusive to that. Um, what what are those called? The, the with the lambda and the method. I forget the name of the, what you called it. In, what 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 you did in the first part does a name for that. Um, expression bodied members yeah, or bodied this, that may people. not be what this is really. Yeah. This is an expression bodied member. I think. Yeah. Expression body method or member, member yeah, I whatever, think is what yeah. they're called. Anyway, so we'll here's the other that. thing you can do with a switch expression that you can't do with a switch statement. You could use that anywhere in expressions allowed, such as a ternary operator. Ooh. You Ooh. could use it. Um, I'm trying to think where else expressions are allowed. Um, well, in some lambdas, right? But you know, I don't have examples, so I'm trying. I'm. This is me, sort of some thought experiment that I could be wrong about. Yeah. So I want to show you how how you can do something even cooler with pattern matching. Remember the the car. Okay, so let's 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 do the car. Let's do the car. Um, but let's say let's say cars are normally. Um, well, let's. So the the rule now that we're adding is that a car with no passengers actually pays uh, 50 cents more. We're saying now, that we don't want the taxi. Fair, yeah. Yeah, I'm the only one I'm the only one with a Tesla. So I'm the only one that can have a car with no passengers, right? <laughs> so let's say that um, a car a car with one passenger, okay? Oh, and I can no longer since I'm actually going to use it, so let's just prove I can't do this. Remember uh, let's go back to our external right. systems. Cars had passengers. Cars right. have passengers. Okay. I can't, since I said it was a discard, I can't do this. That's not going to work. So let's go ahead and say if a car's passengers are one, then they, they pay the base rate. They pay the 50 cents. If the car um, has no passengers, they actually pay a penalty. And maybe this penalty comes from a chart somewhere. Because we don't want, we don't want, uh, we want you to carpool. Um, if the car, <laughs> I, I'm just telling you, I, I don't, I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> a, a, uh, a car with two passengers um, gets a 50 cent discount. Okay. You can see where this is going. I mean, this is just really a pretty Basically, nice syntax. Us, yeah, as we're using this syntax. To, yeah. to use the when is, is all I'm really trying to do. I, I don't I don't think any of us care too much about the base rate or, or what the rule is. It's showing that this syntax lets us not only say it's a car, but look at a look at a, a shape. You know, what's the car shape? What it's almost like destructuring, although it's not destructuring. It's it's saying, hey, if it's a car and it meets this expression test, then this is the value I want to return. Yeah. You could almost say if it's a car and it, and this is just my thinking here. Yeah. If it's a car and it matches this pattern, huh? Yeah, yeah. Pattern right. matching. Yeah, you're right. It is what it is. It's <laughs> pattern matching. So, how do you do that syntax up here in our new switch expression? And uh, I'm not. That's not a pop quiz. Yeah, because I forget. Because uh, I haven't. Yeah. 
Because you haven't done it since earlier today, right? But, but so. can I also say, uh, maybe you're going to show this, but it's not just checking passengers, right? You can say if it's a eight-cylinder engine and it has one passenger, right? I mean, you can really build this out. Yeah, that's because you are allowed, as we saw in some of our earlier examples, you're allowed to, it's an expression, so you could put like an or, the or, uh, the or operator, you know? Right, right. so this um, is what you're doing. So you're putting it in curly brackets. Yeah. This is this is the switch expression methodology, right? I, I hate how that IntelliSense is doing that to me. Yeah, so let's, uh, yeah. So Actually, it almost just, it almost looks like you're taking, you're trying to say I have a class car, and I want you to compare, you know, whatever you're comparing in for a vehicle. If it's a car and it's a class of a car that has the property of passengers equal to this, right? You know, when you new up a new car and you say, well, I can also put the properties mm -hmm. in there at the same time. That's kind of what it looks like there. Hmm. Yep. Yep. And for people who maybe are, are new to uh, C sharp, let's let's show how one of the things you can do is you can say a car, car, car of some kind equals new car. And I can come here and I can use this syntax to go ahead and fill out, you know, what is a passenger like right off the bat? Is it is that what it is? It's or equal. Is it equal? It's, equal. it's an equal. So, yeah. This is what and happens when you use clear, way a, too many languages over okay. and over, right? Just to be clear, that is not a constructor. Right? It's not I mean, a no. constructor. On that. It's yeah, not I mean, a constructor. This right. is called a uh, property initializer. Yep. Property. There you go. Object initializer. And it only works when your property has an auto setter like this. So I think and, that's uh, to be clear, You'd have to have a default constructor uh, that takes no parameters. Because you yeah. are invoking the default constructor, um, it's the right. same. It's the same as if you put the two parentheses after the word car. Uh, right. You are calling the constructor first, but that's a whole other show, a different topic, yep. right? So, to Rich's point, if I just do this and bring this up here, this is starting to look a lot like our syntax down below, mm -hmm. right? And I would say, I don't know what Willie Mammoth thinks is this is beginning to feel a little bit more like some elixir constructs where you say, hey, if it's a struct where the first parameter has this and the second one I don't care and the third one has this or and it's less than four, then run this code. Um, although if we ever do an elixir show, you'll see that uh, it also has pattern matching on function names itself, on like functions itself, which is just, uh, it blows your mind when you see it. That sounds crazy. It's funny when you when you see it this way and you think about the, that's helps visualize it and calling it a shape kind of makes sense, right? The, yeah. the shape of the object. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Can we do? We can do really complex patterns, and what I'm going to do is just paste some code in. I don't know that we're going to care too much about what it does but more that we can see that we can do, we can be really complex here. We can still use when, and we can say, hey, uh, I want you to calculate B's riders, divide it by capacity, and if that's less than 0 0.50, then charge them five plus two dollars. Yeah. And so the, the when syntax, it's, it's basically your choice, right? Like I could have used it car uh, C when um, passengers equals zero or something. I could have used that syntax as well. I want to try something real quick that I do not think is going to work. But, you know, we, we try stuff on this show sometimes. Oh, look at that. Look at what's interchangeable here, I think. <laughs> I mean, we're not getting an error, which I guess doesn't mean anything. But, uh, it looks like this is pretty, pretty interchangeable, pretty uh, interchangeable here, right? Yeah, and it only setters are coming, and that was part of what enabled records, which I think you know we had talked about a little bit. So this stuff is getting pretty interesting, and and you see how I'm kind of mixing and matching here. So if you like the expression syntax, you've got it. You can still bring a when in here. You're not like hamstrung where it's like, oh, I went with expression syntax, so I've got to use this all the time. But here I am bringing down this syntax into the switch statement down here as well. 
and just so everybody can see, right? Um, I want to give all the credit where it's due is to Bill Wagner, who is uh, on the docs team, the C Sharp docs team. And also, uh, Bill Wagner wrote the effective C Sharp book, I believe, but certainly has been known as a C Sharp language expert for a very long time. And he wrote this tutorial, Use Pattern Matching to Build a Type Driven and Data Driven Algorithm. And what he does in this tutorial, and you're going to get the, you're gonna, everybody's going to get the links to this when we build the one tab, is he starts with, with these classes that we talked about and then says, well, let's start implementing. Basically, he says pattern matching makes it easier for you to step by step implement a complex set of calculations. This is the first thing that I was asked to do, implement basic toll calculations. Then I was asked to add occupancy pricing. Then I was asked to add peak pricing. Then I was asked to, you know, and it's just like, huh. Um, what he's trying to say is, is look how much easier it was to write the code by using this kind of syntax. And I think that's the pitch that he's making in this, in this article. Even brings in things like discards, a different pattern matching syntax, which goes further in depth than we did tonight. And can, we, can you slow down a second? Can, can you scroll yeah, which up? Which one do you want to see? Keep, it was a little longer one, I think, but maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, that one there, right? So I'm just looking at this. So in this case, he's got the switch and then the parentheses. Well, that's oh, because sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. On, in this case, the switch is on. Uh, sorry, I just want to read this here. So, it, uh, oh, OK. So it's on like an anonymous type, basically, or something like that, because um, the switch is on basically th three properties, right? Is weekday, get time band and inbound. Right, so it's not on an object that we would think of like vehicle. This is really interesting. Yeah, so what's happening here is the switch expression is more complex than just handing off uh, an identifier like vehicle. It's saying, okay, it's I want type, a, an really, right? in place tuple. Yeah. I'm pretty oh, sure tuple, this is yeah. is, a, is the new the new the new tuples right? An in place tuple calculate. Uh, Calculate the time of the toll, or if it's a weekday, calculate the time band. So I guess that helps you figure out whether it's peak or not, and then calculate whether they're inbound. And and then you just make like a chart. It's almost like you took a table that you might have drawn yeah. X's and values in, and you just translate it directly to code. This is in this very example. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. I think this really shows a lot of power that you know we weren't seeing. You don't have to have an object, basically, no. uh, like you well, know a traditional object. And tuples enable that. Now that we have these real, this really powerful tuple syntax that we didn't have before. Right. Um, so one of the things he does at the very end of this is he says, if you've noticed that once you get to false, everything is a dollar. So I can discard those last two values and get rid of all of this. Oh. Right, because it just doesn't matter. Yep. <laughs> Jeez. So let me see. I have... Do I have that sample here? I meant to have the finished sample, yes. Because if we look at the finished sample, which I don't know that we're definitely, it'll be easy for us to go through. But what he does is he creates a bunch of cars. He create, and this is using object initializer syntax, which looks an awful lot like that switch comparison syntax um, to Rich's point from earlier. And uh, he creates the cars, creates the taxis, creates the buses, creates the delivery trucks, and then starts calculating tolls, right? And and this is, you know, so that's the program part. That's the boring part. The toll calculator is this is how things ended up where he said, okay, we didn't do this. You saw how in my, in my example, we switched on vehicle. But then what happened is, is after switching on vehicle and saying, well, wow, I've got this redundant car. What if I made a switch expression out of how to evaluate a car, which is what's happening here? Mm. So you've got a nested switch expression that says, so switch on the vehicle. If it's a car, then switch on the passengers and make your decision. If it's a taxi, switch on the fares and make your decision. If it's a bus, well, switch didn't really wasn't really the right thing. So let's stick with when to calculate this um, expression. And then if it's less than 0.5, then do this. If it's greater than 0.9, do this. Otherwise, just make it $5. So uh, purposely mixing these different ways to do it, right? 
Um, when he calculated peak time premium, he used tuples. So this is a tuple, which is funny. If you're new to C sharp, it's it's certainly getting confused with with uh, function parameters, right? Method parameters here. Yeah. The the parameter the method takes a date time and it takes a bool. And then the first thing we do is we say, well, let's put the bool here as the third member of the tuple. Um, let's let's call a different function get time band that's telling us whether it's overnight, daytime, morning rush, whatever. And then let's call another function to tell us whether it's a weekday and then switch on that. Yeah. And well, uh, what's you know, great about this, I mean, obviously, as we look at this, right, this is, there's nothing here that we couldn't have solved. You know, like we, we could do this beforehand. Oh, right? sure. It, it just was a mess, right? right? And this is just, this is why I think I put in the, in the, you know, we were promoting this show. Like, this is the kind of stuff that you can use to make your code better tomorrow. Yeah. Like, um, you know, and it just, it just makes your code. It does. I mean, well, better is a, is a subjective, I guess, but it certainly makes your code, you know, cleaner. Uh, it takes a little getting used to, you know, once you know the syntax and things like that. But I love it. This is just something that, like, it's not that kind of feature where you have to go and like implement a whole bunch of stuff and retrain everybody on how to. This is just right there. Beautiful syntax. So here's an interesting observation of mine. And I know this has nothing to do with pattern matching, right? But you can't help but start looking at these other features because they really mesh together. Is before our new and improved tuple syntax, how many people would have created some kind of peak time struct or class that you would have then, you would have given it a time of toll and an inbound, and then you would have gotten like some kind of enum or something, something strongly typed mm -hmm. that then you might have switched on that. And what what tuples, and I know some people say tuples, so I even confuse myself with it sometimes. I say tuples. What this is starting to do is it's starting to say, don't create that class or struct for one calculation and make the developer go. And, and look, I'm being opinionated when I say this because there is another side to this. Don't make the developer go off and read the class to figure out whatever that method was. Just put the calculation right in their face. And then they can see what the they can see that peak time premium was based on these things. And I'm I, I can infer what's probably happening here, and I can infer what's happening here. I don't need to go look anywhere else. And uh, I'm not cluttering up my my um code base with a one of those little tiny structs or classes that does nothing more than gather information in a certain shape. And I never would have thought about that before this. And it wouldn't have even occurred to me. But uh, things like these features are beginning to make me think about like, wow, instead of even testing for whether it's a time of uh, inbound or not, well, I don't have to. So, so let me make it clear to the reader that not only, not only what I am doing here and saying, yes, on a weekday, overnight, it's 75 cents. And I'm making it clear that it does not matter whether you're inbound or not. Where previous code, you go, huh, you've got the same value for inbound as outbound. Is that what the spec says? It's like I'm saying very clearly, when the spec says it doesn't matter, I say it doesn't matter. Uh, what else? Premiums without patterns. Um, I'm not. I'm trying to see if there's new constructs here that we haven't covered tonight, and I'm not really seeing it. We saw this. We've seen this switch syntax, and we've seen. Oh, look at this. This switch on hour. <clears throat> look at this new keyword. Or. Yeah. Or. So right. switch on that, the hour. That, that. If it's less than six or greater than nineteen, then we're overnight. And boy, that's pretty simple compared to if time of toll dot hour is less than six. Uh, pipe pipe or oh, uh, pipe pipe time of toll dot hour greater than 19 then I mean one line now one thing that's happened with the switch statement which which was a change to the language is because previously the switch statement only took constant uh, cases your your cases were always constants the ordering of the case statements by definition do not matter because it, it didn't, there was no way that you could fall through. There was no way that since since the since what you were evaluating was always a constant, it, it, you could change that code around as much as you wanted. That is no longer true. 
And it is one of those gray area breaking changes where it's not a breaking change because no old code could have ever been compiled that mattered. But if you change the order of your switch evaluations here, not just in a switch expression, but in a switch statement, and you're using these new features, it stops at the first one that matches. And it says, there's the match. Right. That was right. impossible before. So it's not yeah. a breaking yeah. change. It's not, but it's a mind, bend, maybe, do we call it a mind bending change? Because if you were really used to how switch worked, I'm telling you now the order matters. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it's, it's one of those things you never think about, right? It's, you don't think about it. It's fairly implied, I guess, yeah. by the syntax here of what you're showing. However, um, you could, and you know, here's the value of, you know, let's say, talk about unit testing or something like that. You could mistakenly uh, have two things that overlap themselves in here, not thinking about, you say, greater than six and less than 15, and another one that says greater than seven and less than 15. And well, if, if they're in the wrong order, then they're going to, it's going to hit, you know, the wrong one or something like that. And so you do want to think about that stuff. And, and you know, testing can be helpful there, I think. But yeah. Um, but no, you're right. It's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. Another thing to remember. Yeah. Yeah. What I need for this is, um, and I don't think it would be hard to make like a little cheat sheet that just shows a whole bunch of different um, options. You know, it's almost like that example of that, that complicated example that you showed from the docs, which showed how you can fall through different types of switches and, and things like that. Something like that would be, could be like a bit of a cheat sheet showing that you can use the or, showing that you can use the when and the you know the the curly brackets, uh, you know all those different things. I don't know if you found a sample that was like a good cheat sheet uh, in your in your searches. I mean, this sample certainly <laughs> he tries to do a lot. Let me see if I can get. Um, uh, I'm trying to get a, another window over here that. Uh, second so what else do we need here we need we need um i think we definitely need the the github repo um what do we need what it need for what in order to to show the resources that i'm talking about here there, there is definitely uh sorry where is that repo I can't, I can't find the name of it. Okay, so it's github.net samples. That's what it is. So it turns out that this is actually an incredible resource. But um, I don't imagine on, there's on GitHub, there is a C sharp, there's a samples uh, uh, repo, and then under there is C sharp. And then under there, I, there was pattern matching. You're right. And it did show things. But under tutorials is patterns, and this is the toll calculator sample. The toll calculator sample goes along with um, Bill Wagner's toll calculator um, website, the, the web page that I was showing you. So uh, I want to make sure that I get those in there too. So I'll have to make sure I find that. One thing we didn't talk about tonight is when can you use each of these features? And this is where it's a little interesting. So we've talked about C-sharp 9. Mm -hmm. So C-sharp 9 pattern matching features, uh, some of them we ran into tonight, you have to be on .NET 5, which is the version coming out in just a couple of weeks at .NET Conf, right? Yep, November 10th and 10th to the 11th or 10th to the 12th? Yeah, yeah. basically any day now. You know, right. I mean, that's close to really two weeks. Like, so yeah. this... In this C sharp language versioning doc, you can find the defaults for when you uh, when you start one of these projects. And and I did try to confirm that that you need .NET five to use C sharp nine. And I did I I read that over and over. Same thing. You might remember that we had that similar rule with .NET Core three for C sharp eight. Yeah. Um, although it was you know, and so .NET standard supported C sharp eight, but .NET Core uh, two and previous. .NET Framework supports C Sharp 7.3 because the language was was moving along. They weren't actually revving 
I guess it's the uh, I don't know what it is that that changed. It might be the compiler, or if the runtime is changing. I, I actually don't know. I'm not enough of a language and compiler nerd. <laughs> I, I I think it's You're fascinating. Pretty stuff. big nerd. Let's just be clear about this. Is that what it is? Yeah. So, um, yeah. What do you think? What do you think? I think it's pretty cool. I think this stuff's great. I think it's one of those. So the problem I have, this is not a problem. This is a, I don't write code every day as much as I'd like to. Um, so we, and we've kidded around about it on the show here before is that sometimes I forget the new, uh, the new switch expression syntax. And I find myself writing an old express, old switch statement and then like right clicking and using like resharper to convert it into a, into a switch expression for me and things like that. And so, um, so the thing for me is going to be like remembering this stuff. Now it's, it's, it's not too complicated. So a quick Google search uh, and some of the docs you're linking to here will, will help me remember, but yeah, I want to get this into my, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I want to get into my quote, like, uh, programming muscle memory, you know, where I just, I just know mm -hmm. this, syntax for these things and it becomes my go-to um syntax for some of these things because it's just better it's just nice yeah um rich do you use a lot of this stuff you don't write a ton of code or do you, you know? yeah i don't write it there's some places now that i could probably you know thinking of going back and 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 kind of redoing it this way if i get the the chance but yeah a lot of my stuff doesn't wind up in production anymore so yeah, yeah, right. That's I'm actually writing some code these days, so I gotta like, you know, gotta step up my game again, you know. Yeah. So what do we need here? We've got the C sharp language versioning, which I would say you need in order for this, uh, not just to see which which you need, but if you wanted if you wanted to change your language version uh, in your CS proj file, you're going to want um, that little bit of XML, and then here's the table that tells you what you're allowed to use, uh, the, the actual definition of pattern matching in the docs. I actually really found this tour of C sharps, uh, pattern matching. Let me click. So it's directly to it. Um, in the tour of C sharp, you can learn more about pattern matching and then, you know, it goes off to that same doc. Uh, we talked about discards. What we have not talked about tonight is where do you get .NET? Uh, the home of .NET is D-O-T-N-E-T, -E which then takes you to .NET.Microsoft.com. And you can download it for any platform. You can download it for Windows, Linux, Mac. Um, and what you'll want to do now is, is if you're interested in using the very latest and greatest, you'll want to come up here, or there's other ways to get to it, and get .NET 5 RC2. Or we'll just include the link in the one tab that takes you right to it. You'll get your Linux, Mac, Windows downloads, or scripts, which I think is, I haven't tried this yet, but I'd like to. I'd like to try out scripts because I'm very interested in instead of having to download an installer, mm -hmm. can I can I automate that? Uh, this wasn't something that they've had in a few. Uh, this was this hasn't always been there, and I haven't gotten to test it out now that I'm seeing this. I really like the idea. This uh, C sharp repo, I've jumped straight to the pattern matching sample. That pattern matching sample from Bill Wagner is the companion for this tutorial to use pattern matching to build type-driven and data-driven algorithms. And then we did just really quickly, somebody asked, hey, what does it look like in F-sharp? Um, or is it similar, you know, how similar is it? And so we've got that in there too. And I think um, maybe that's uh, gonna be our list. What I'm gonna do here at some point, just before we go, is make sure that we save this tab off, get it into the chat, and also yes. it'll be on the YouTube video. Yeah, so I must have missed something earlier when we were talking about this 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 uh, tabs thing. So yeah, I'll show you. I didn't realize what you were doing. So you basically, what it does is, does it grab your open tabs or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, watch. We also, let's do this. And let's... Yeah, uh, yeah right. Put Twitter on there. Yeah. Let's do... Sure. I don't want to turn it too much into uh, open yeah, advertisement, open. right? Right. Let's do it. Why not? We're allowed. Yeah, so okay, so you do that. So now you do this and you've got all these tabs. Yeah. And now I click one tab and I get this list of everything we talked about. Now, this is cool, but it's still confined to my machine. I can um, very quickly click restore all and boom, my tabs are back. 
That's kind of neat. That's kind of a cool thing. But what if I said here, share as web page. Now this I can share with everyone. Mm -hmm. so In fact, QR let me, code. it's going to take me a second, but let me get it into the, uh, into the dev talk show chat for those, everybody following along. And you'll see that this is a, uh, Something that you can all use Richard right White's away. Richard Whitesaki saying he likes that with his sixty tabs open. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got to wonder, Richard, if you'll crash this thing because you have so many tabs open, <laughs> it won't it won't work. Maybe, but hopefully it will. <laughs> so I've I've I don't do this all the time. I've done it sometimes at Philly.net where I you know in, when I'm building a presentation, I've got like fifty tabs open, and what I'll do is I'll say, hey, these are the resources I think people can use. Sure, I'll list them all on a wiki page or you can list them all on a YouTube doc, but give you this web page and here you go. Now, how, do they um, do they guarantee these are going to stay around for a while? I'm just curious. This is one tab. It, it's a it's another website. It's not your own. It's not just giving you the HTML. It's it's some service. Um, yeah. Do you know what the like? Uh, I don't know if the, the SLA is. Just, no. I, yeah, I, what the SLA is. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Um, it's kind of it's pretty cool, like you say, for doing demos and you're talking about things. And at the end, as long as you don't, as long as you remember to keep all those tabs open, yeah, um, that's pretty cool. I, I feel like this could really be helpful at work, uh, in demonstrations and stuff like that, in meetings, you know, whatever. Yeah, so this is going to get included. Uh, so if you're watching on YouTube right now, just go down to the uh, to the description and you'll see this one tab for the things we talked about tonight. The reason I didn't create it ahead of time is as I said, you know, um, what if somebody comes up with, somebody did, uh, Wooly Mammoth said, how does this look in F sharp? So I said, Hey, let's throw that in there. I actually, while we were chatting a little bit, I, I wanted to find a, a good Elixir example in the docs and I just couldn't. So that's, that's on me. Um, <clears throat> because I think the way that they, like I said, imagine if you could do this, but you could go one step further. And, de and in your function declaration said, execute this code when these parameters meet some expression. Mm -hmm. And now you have something that you can do in Elixir, nice. which I think is pretty cool. And it, again, what it does is it starts modularizing the code more and more to where you're going, well, in this case, do this. And in that case, do that. That's not what the code says, but it's what you think in your head. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, you know, what's interesting. I was just thinking about this, too. Um, so there was a QR code on there. Right? Yeah. So think about this. You know, we flash up uh, URLs on the on the show. Um, but, you know, this is a long URL and like people would have to write it down and stuff like that. So if you put that QR, the QR code is up on screen uh, right now. Right. Uh, it's You so, can see it through Skype. Oh, right? I can see it. Oh, because yeah. I'm looking at. Yeah, but that's OK. Go yeah, ahead. I just I'm want to see what happens if I. Is it? Oh, yeah, Mike, it's getting it. So I wasn't sure if it was, you know, too grainy or something like that. So look at that. So that actually is a cool way to share resources for, you know, the videos that we make and for the stream because people don't have to write it down. Yep. Uh, or we could always, co of course, put the link in the, in the, you know, comments and things like that. Like, you know, on a YouTube video, we could always add it to the, to the notes or something like that. But I think this is, is a, a, uh, you know, that's like a strong feature. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I think having the QR code there in the video makes it easy for them to, because they can't click on links in the video, right? You unless you that's have to put the comments yeah, below. Right. Yeah. I'm with you. Right. That's what I'm saying. The QR code. So do we want to put the, U, the, the QR code up one more time? And it's something we'll think about in the future, right? Is, um, I guess. Oh, whoops. What did yeah, I do? The, I guess there's competitors to it too, because uh, Javost is saying you can use the URL, the the URL is U-R-L-I-S-T dot com. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. Um, we could pop that up in a future chat too if that yeah. works. Yeah, we'll take so, a look at it. See. It's always helpful. And, uh, and you know, what I will probably do is when we sign off here is turn that into a Bitly link. And then forever it'll be associated with uh, my Bitly account. The thing I like about that is that when people click on that link, then at least I know like, oh, 50 people clicked on it or one yeah, a little Zero. Bit of I'll yeah. go ask. I'll go ask my mom to click on it. Right. But uh, uh, thanks followers. to Javost for uh, throwing something at us there, helping yeah, us out. That's We're cool. always interested Appreciate in that. hearing about other things. No, I'm actually checking it out right now. The URL is. Let's see. 
Yeah, look at that. It's probably now. I wonder if this is a browser. What's nice about yours was that it was a plugin. Um, yeah, I happen to be using that, it in Edge. I can tell you, I've used it in Chrome and Firefox. Yeah, so that that's cool. That's one of those little things that um, this is bonus material, uh, folks. You come to the show, we're learning about pattern matching and all these things, and then like. Isn't it cool when you pick up and there's like one of these little tips and you're just like, wow, that could change my job. Like tomorrow, that one tab could be really helpful. So I love that stuff. Yep. Yep. And that's what we're here for. So we, I love that the community reaches out and, and we learn from them because that's this is a conversation show. This is not we we'll always try to make sure on the Dev Talk show that they say, hey, join the conversation. It's not, you know, come listen to the lecture because, boy, that sounds boring. Right. Right. So next week. Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. And that's really important that you pay attention to the U.S. Eastern Time Zone because this weekend, what are we doing here in a lot of the U.S.? We're falling back. Yeah, we're trick-or-treating and we are falling <laughs> back an hour. I had the wrong answer. Yeah. And mine's a good answer. Yeah. Um, so we're falling back an hour, which means that we go from, if you if UTC works for you, we're not four Four hours behind UTC, we will be five hours behind UTC. And that actually means, uh, I guess that means the show starts an hour earlier than where else? Later? No, no, that's trouble. I can't even, now I can't even it's, think about it, right? Boy, yeah, I can't so even think straight. So right now we're UTC minus four. And this when will be we, an hour later. Maybe. Yeah, so when we fall back, it'll be an hour earlier because we're eight o'clock now turns to seven o'clock. So, oh, yeah. right. So you're five hours. It's UTC minus five now. <laughs> That's what I know. You know, we need to write an app. <laughs> if only there were conversion apps. Yeah, you just bing it. It's right. So if you bring up, yeah, exactly. if you if you just bring up a page and bing it and say what's the UTC conversion, it will show you. So right. you know the YouTube the devtalkshow.com website should do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that should be a show. Is updating the Dev Talk Show website to add. An automatic UTC conversion based on your browser settings. If that's, I mean, I think that's possible. It should be possible, yeah. So. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. Well, anyway, we're really now getting into the digression yeah. uh, category here. If, so, you hey, really if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you uh, make sure you subscribe so you'll know when we have new videos. Make sure you hit the like button so that we know this is the kind of show you want to see. And then go down to the comments and tell us what you think about pattern matching or what do you think about one tab other languages with pattern matching. Send us some links, show us where we can learn more about these kind of techniques because one of the things that's made me a better C-sharp programmer is working with other languages and saying, hey, I like how they do something over there. So I think it's super important. Don't forget that you can always find us at uh, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the dev talk show, or a quick URL that'll always get you there is video.devtalkshow.com. Other than that, watch out for announcement next week's show will be on Twitter, right? We'll say, and we also on our meetup site, we get people to sign up there. You know, people will see what the show is going to be. They'll sign up. Anything else we should let people know? Uh, we mentioned .NET Conf coming up. Yep. Yes. Um, right? What, uh, November 10th. Yeah, I see a lot of other, I don't have any links in my hand, but I remember seeing some other stuff that's coming up that looks interesting. Isn't... Uh, Aren't isn't uh, Jeff Fritz and his live coders? Do they have something coming up? I thought I saw live coders conference is coming up, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't know what the day is. I think they moved it. I saw something on Twitter today, or something. Um, but they have a conference coming up. I'll see if I could find that real quick while we're. It does say so. Uh, it is. You know, a friend of ours, Jason Gaylord, who is also on the Tech Bash board, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay. does have a recent blog post just from less than a week ago that it's coming October 29th. So Which unless that date moved, that's it. Other than that, maybe we should let yeah. everybody go. Yeah, I think so. I'm yeah, so thank you for sticking with us on Twitch. And thanks for, uh, if you watched us on YouTube all the way to the end here, then thank you. That's pretty awesome. Otherwise, again, um, make sure you reach out to us on Twitter, join the conversation, and we will see you next Wednesday uh, at 8.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on The Dev Talk Show.